It's a wonderful time to be active in the field of higher education. Uh, you, can, you can actually smell the revolution that's brewing, uh, particularly in my, my own field in economics. Uh, this is particularly pronounced, and at the minute we're seeing uh, a wave of student protests and sit-ins and occupations, letters to the deans of faculty creating their own curricula uh, in protest against what's being dished up to them in universities. Um, I'm guessing you're from Gordonstown, is that right? Any young economists? Good. It's an exciting world you're heading into because it really is a, it's a field that's so animated and dynamized by disaffection with the current system. And what's interesting is at the moment, the, the focus of the student discontent tends to be with what they're being taught, the curriculum. So the, not a rejection of the dominant neoliberal economic paradigm, but, but a desire that it not be the only thing taught, that there be a wide range of other economic approaches that are being taught. And this is important, but it seems to me that perhaps even more important and something that I'm even more deeply interested in is not the curriculum, but the pedagogy, is actually the way that we're teaching. And it seems to me that here, the potential for revolutionizing the classroom and revolutionizing the whole way that we as a society learn is much greater. So when I talk about bringing the classroom back to life, it's not just in a metaphorical sense of reanimating the classroom, it's actually existentially, literally, bringing us back into an alignment with life that we've actually lost. So just a few words now. What I, what I want to do is I want to describe to you some of the ways that we play with pedagogy in the economics classroom at Schumacher College um, in very specific ways. But before going there, just another word of introduction to this idea that we are somehow separate from life. That we're children of the Enlightenment, this extraordinary period, this extraordinary period of, of intellectual formant that provided the foundations for the scientific, technological, industrial revolution. And the, 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 the inheritance that we've gathered from this period is an astonishing, astonishing leaps in terms of our material abundance. Any of you who, are, who visit folk museums, showing, illustrating the way people used to live two or three hundred years ago, it's incomparably, we're incomparably richer in material terms. And uh, I try to remember to give a little, a little prayer of gratitude to fossil fuels and the Industrial Revolution every time I sit in a dentist's chair or even put a, a stack of laundry into the washing machine. I mean, we are immeasurably richer as a, as a result of this. However, we've, played a, we've paid a terrible cost, huge cost. And the cost is that our whole cultural narrative and the language that it, that, that it has generated is one of separation, that we stand outside of the rest of creation, understanding it minutely and, and seeing it in terms of ecosystem services and resources and the environment as something that is somehow separate from us that we can manipulate for our own comfort. Um, one of the great Enlightenment thinkers was René Descartes, and uh, he used to tell his vivisection students who were cutting up animals live that they were not really alive, they didn't have soul, they were, they were effectively dead, they were machine-like. And so the screams they could hear were not discomfort on the part of the animal, it was simply the churning of the cogs as they broke into the machine. And this is our lineage. You know, this is a worldview that is extraordinary and is extra it would seem utterly inconceivable to most people, certainly through the course of human history, the worldview we have at the moment, standing apart, apart outside of life uh, in a universe that is effectively meaningless and dead in which we, our rational minds, are the only source of meaning and intelligence and thus we're orphaned in this sea of meaninglessness, would be inconceivable, incomprehensible to most people, or to, for, for most of the human story, and still significant parts of the human population today. So we need to find, I want to suggest, before going into the pedagogy and the role that pedagogy has to play in this, that the principal task facing our global civilization today is to weave ourselves back into the weft of life rather than standing outside of it, manipulating it for our benefits.
So how do we do this in, like an economics classroom would seem an improbable place to start. Um, but we're working hard on it. And I, I, just to say that, that, that a lot of the, the principle of what I'm talking about is actually not limited to economics. It's transferable to any part of the curriculum, but this is the area that I work in. So I want to suggest three complementary, interrelated ways of working, pedagogical research projects, if you would, that we're working on as a way of bringing the students back into life, back into the, the weave of life. The first is to, is to very consciously invite the students to bring, not to park their emotional self, their physical self, their intuitive self at the door of the classroom, but to invite them in. I started working with this actually here in Fintorn with my friend and mentor Craig Gibson when I was working on, uh, we were trying to communicate ecological footprinting. Is that a concept that's familiar to you? I'm looking at the young people. Ecological footprinting, it's a, it's, a, it's a way, it's a composite measure for our impact on our ecosystems. So it's a, a looking at the, the, the waste we produce, the amount of food, the ecological impact of all, really, of all of our economic activities, our subsistence activities. And so in working on a purely conceptual level with students and explaining to them just the, I mean, the dire impact of human beings on the planet at the moment. So for example, if everyone were to live the lifestyle of an average North American, we'd need five planets. For an average Western European lifestyle, we need about three and a half planets to satisfy our needs. We're eating into the fabric of the planet. And working initially on a purely conceptual level, I noticed two things. The first thing was that students would respond almost in every case with the intellect in problem-solving mode. No space for, for the emotion, an emotional response, which to me seems, seemed, seems natural. Um, and the second thing that I noticed was that within a very short time, often within less than an hour, it was as if the session hadn't happened. It was reduced to a series, perhaps, of clever after-dinner anecdotes. But in terms of really impacting, transforming consciousness, very little sign. So what we started playing with, Craig and I started playing with, was just taking the students out onto the, the grassy area and the, the village green. And uh, I remember we started by making four circles. So a relatively small group of people representing North, American, North Americans would make a fingertip to fingertip huge circle denoting the amount of ecological space they were taking. Uh, there was then a second circle, uh, again, a relatively small number of Western Europeans, proportionate to our population globally. So a relatively small number of Western Europeans in a generous but slightly smaller circle. Then there was a third circle uh, with more participants, more students representing Central American, Eastern European populations. So the circle was noticeably tighter but still generous. And then finally, most of the participants, over half, in one dense huddle, representing Indians, Africans, Chinese. And immediately, and again, watching the students, get over your giggles, get over your nervousness, just watch. And immediately, moving beyond the students, moving beyond intellectual cleverness and response and problem solving to deeply sensing and feeling because the cells of the body were involved in the learning process. And suddenly, catharsis, emotional engagement, and deeply transformative conversations. And uh, interestingly, um, very frequently, the Americans and the North Americans looking at the Indian, African, Chinese circle and going, ah, we feel lonely. That looks so intimate. Interesting. And having lived in Africa, I really get a sense of the truth of that. So, this has been a big area for me of working on how we can bring theater, constellation work into the classroom so that the students, rather than simply standing outside of problems, challenges, and trying to analyze them from the outside, actually entering into empathic engagement and identification with the actors within a system, whether they be future generations not yet born, rich people, poor people, uh, ecosystems, species that are affected, that rather than considering this to be an intellectual game, challenge to be solved, a puzzle to be solved, that it's actually a, 
a system, a constellation in which we are actively engaged as participants and by moving positions and taking the perspective of somebody in a different position or another species or a being not yet born, feeling a deep sense of empathic identification, which is a huge source of intelligence and power. So the idea, the, the radical idea within the Western tradition that, that intelligence, understanding, meaning is derived not just by the left side of the brain, but is actually that the body is a very important source of information. We need to take it seriously. Um, the emotion, our emotional selves, our intuitive selves. So that's the first thread, the first active pedagogical inquiry, is how to bring the whole person into the classroom as an active participant. A second relates to language, the power of language to frame how we see the world. So, the reality of the unfolding, the unfolding nature of reality is essentially verb-like. It's continually in transition, continually moving, continually shifting. But what we do with human language is we tend to take clunky nouns and impose the nouns on what in fact are fluid, ever-changing situations. And what we then see is that particularly in periods of rapid change, is that the words we use to describe reality, which frames how we interpret reality, is actually some distance behind the nature of the reality itself. Um, so, for example, I worked for 15, 20 years in a field, and I, I, I struggle to even say the word, it is such an ugly, brutal, uh, unhelpful word, development. Anybody want to be development workers? I mean, it's a lovely aspiration, but we have such dysfunction, and the dysfunction is because of the language and the narratives that we use to understand the phenomenon. So the language is, I mean, the very, very words development, progress, first world, second world, third world, defining wealth purely in terms of income, you know, relegates most of humanity to a position of infinite inferiority to ourselves. There are whole other ways of describing the phenomenon. Um, I mean, my own preferred are to do with with there being a fabulous mosaic of beautifully attuned human adaptation to the specificity of place, in which those who live in the desert, those who live in the deep forest, those who live on mountainsides have each found stories, governance systems, material cultures, ideally beautifully attuned to the specificity of that place. But this gets steamrollered under the linear progression of third world to first world, creating enormous damage. Uh, there's a, a heartbreaking story of a tiger in a zoo in Moscow that was kept in a 10 meter by 10 meter cage. And at a certain point, in the, I think there was a change of um, regime at the zoo, it became clear to the zookeepers this was no longer acceptable. They raised the bars and gave the tiger a much bigger uh, pen to roam in. The tiger never left the 10 by 10 by the rest of its life, behaving as if the cage was still there. And it seems to me that this is a, this is a very poignant metaphor because it describes exactly our condition, that the fluid nature of reality means there are far more options that we're not seeing because we don't have the language to identify, or the language that we're using immediately activates known categories that keep us imprisoned in old ways of thinking. So, to give one example of this, uh, something I've been really excited by, um, the, the, the 20th century has been dominated by an increasingly sterile, stagnant dispute between left and right. Is it more state? Is it more market? Those are the only two options. So, the Berlin Wall falls, the Soviet Union crumbles, capitalism declares the end of history, and Thatcher triumphantly declares there is no alternative. And because of the poverty of our language, it's kind of difficult, right? Maybe she's right. And certainly, I think that outside of Scotland, thank you for busting this myth, but outside of Scotland, certainly living in England at the minute, we're so deeply stuck in this, there is no alternative. But over recent years, over the last decade or so, we've seen a rediscovery of this beautiful concept of the commons much longer lineage than either state or market, describing 
conditions, societies in which, which, are, which are characterized by reciprocity, mutuality, and governance by the people who live in areas, much smaller scale, uh, much more engagement of community control of our own resources. And with the emergence of the digital commons, we suddenly are now seeing linguistic proliferation. So we've got, and this might be difficult for the young people to believe, but 10 years ago, hacker spaces, fab labs, innovation hubs, crowdfunding, uh, the collaborative economy, nobody had ever heard of these words. And suddenly the emergence of this linguistic Fertility both reflects the emerging future and creates more conceptual space for it to emerge into, for it to, to grow into, expand into. So something that I always love during the course of our master's program is that as we go on, students get ever more into the habit of interrupting themselves. So they're speaking and they go, no, that's not the right word. That's not the right word. Um, and then trying, struggling to find a word that better encapsulates than the existing vocabulary their felt experience. So we, to help them on their way, we had a, a global expert on development come and speak to us. And we said to him, you can use any word in the dictionary, but not development. <laughs> uh, we had a, 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 a very celebrated monetary thinker and we said, you know, you know what's coming. You can use any word in the dictionary except money. So in other words, really, what are we talking about? What is the fluid nature of what we're trying to explore here beyond the term that keeps us imprisoned in our cages? The final, the, the, the final thread, the third thread, is exploring in the field of economics not just the outer journey of transition, but the inner journey. So we, th th this word economy is extraordinary. It's a seven-letter word, economy. This, big, clunky noun, and I think that many of us, certainly I have the inclination to see it as being this abstract thing out there that does things to me, you know, usually things that I don't particularly enjoy. Um, whereas on closer inspection, it reveals itself to be a matrix of billions of activities, actions, exchanges that happen every day in which we are deeply implicated as co-creators. We're not just victims of an abstract system, we are co-creators along with billions of others in the dance that every day is born in you as the economy. Uh, one of the great insights that Fritz Schumacher came back from Burma with was that, uh, this is the author of Small is Beautiful, to which I, I strongly commend to you if you haven't read it. Um, he came back with the insight that economics in the West is defined as a science of scarcity on the assumption that demand will always exceed supply. But he came back from Burma saying in the Buddhist tradition, the cultivated woman and man seeks abundance not by increasing the material consumption, but by reducing their needs on the basis of a deep study of the nature of desire. So there's much that we can do, that we need to do to deeply explore our own values and how they translate into our behaviors and how we can bring them into closer alignment. So then thus the need to, to have a study of the outer journey of transition complemented in parallel with an inner journey of transition at the same time. So this is um, the final piece of work submitted by uh, uh, a particularly brilliant student who was inclined to abstract thought. Um, and so this was the final piece of work. This is just a short piece from a final piece of work that uh, he, it was actually a postscript to his final written essay for the residential part of the economics master's program. I noticed how disconnected my patterns of conduct were from my thinking. Here I was incapable of listening, separating myself from the rest of the class and working on my own while the theory and vision that I was proposing, that is a commons-based society, were one of being together, of collaborating, sharing, co-creating, as if the society which I was advocating could emerge from an individual will. I realized that I needed to move beyond a critique of the capitalist system and to start commoning. That is, in the words of Tim Rayner, each act of commoning be a matter be it a matter of collaborative consumption, peer-to-peer -peer production, open space technology, or democratic assembly, is an experimental contribution towards a new social and economic paradigm. 
With hindsight, these insights are both terrible and fantastic. They're terrible because I've spent the past 20 years of my life training in order to become ever more productive and efficient. On the other hand, they're fantastic since they give me the obligation to start embracing a totally new way of being. A way of being which means first and foremost having the intention of being in and making society and community, of connecting and cooperating with others, to being present, taking notice, and finally giving. Thank you.